I'm Dr. Homera Bhatia, and welcome to this presentation. Uh, we are uh, talking about coronavirus, and the first few slides I'm going to share with you are about an introduction to COVID-19, and, um, and we're going to be talking about treatment in a later presentation. COVID-19, or the novel beta uh, coronavirus, is now called SARS-CoV-2, is the seventh coronavirus known to infect human beings. And as we know, it's been declared a global pandemic by the WHO on March 11. There are unfortunately no specific treatments or vaccinations available now. It can infect both humans and animals, and in humans it causes um, a disease anywhere ranging from a common cold to the SARS or MERS. So um, we saw that there are seven strains that can infect human beings, and what we know are the common SARS virus, which occurred in 2003, it was a beta coronavirus causing the acute uh, respiratory syndrome. Then we saw the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome in 2012. And now we're seeing the SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus infectious disease 2019, also known as COVID-19. So there are many theories about where it came from, some theories about bats and the Wuhan seafood market. And of course, the conspiracy theories talking about uh, human beings um, actually creating this virus in a lab in China. Uh, we don't know enough about this. Uh, and the WHO says that this was definitely a natural animal origin virus, and we don't yet know enough to comment. So the means of spread are through droplets, that so the droplets can come through cough when 3,000 droplets are, re are released, or a sneeze when 40,000 droplets can be released. And these can, droplets can travel six feet, and there's also evidence for aerosols, aerosols in, the, in the air, which then can travel even further, and which can linger in the air. The droplets enter through the respiratory mucous membranes, and they also stay on surfaces for days. And it really care has to be taken to disinfect surfaces properly with the appropriate disinfectants. At least more than 60% ethanol should be used. And there are four stages in the pandemic. The stage one is where uh, the virus uh, is present only in travelers who brought the virus from other countries. Stage two, when people who have been in contact with the traveler get it. Stage three is when it spreads in the community. And stage four is when it's a pan in epidemic and is widespread with no specific pattern or spread. The incubation period is around seven days and the case fatality rate is around 3%, although we see a much higher case fatality rate in Italy. And there are many theories for why Italy and certain European countries had case fatalities of 10 to 12 percent. It could be that um, the, the, the people or the population there was more elderly as compared to the first country, China. Or it could have been that there wasn't very widespread testing. Um, so people who were much sicker got the test. And hence, the percentage of people who were very ill also was uh, and died and succumbed to the disease was also higher. Uh, this doesn't explain what happened in Germany, because Germany also has an elderly population, and Germany also did widespread testing, but in Germany, the case fatality rate was well under 5%. It also occurs more commonly in the elderly, um, over the age of 60, are more susceptible, and male. So the male gender being susceptible and also dying at almost double the rate of females is something of concern, and we don't fully understand it. It could be that males are uh, have a higher percentage of smokers and hence of chronic lung disease, COPD. Uh, however, um, this doesn't fully explain the male gender being affected. There's also a theory that the ACE2 receptor codes on the X chromosome, and hence that women are protected because of this. Uh, but again, we don't fully know why males are dying at double the rate almost of females. 80% of patients anyway will have mild to moderate disease, and in 13%, it can end up being severe and critical in 6% of patients. The clinical symptoms are mostly fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Some, um, some peculiar symptoms are loss of smell and taste, severe fatigue and myalgias have been described, and some patients have gastrointestinal or skin manifestations. There's lots of common um, um, uh, overlap between the flu, common cold, and the flu. But common cold tends to have lower fevers and have more of runny nose or sneezing, which is not present in COVID-19. It is difficult to distinguish between the regular flu and the COVID-19 symptoms. So a confirmed case is someone who lab test is positive and has typical symptoms. However, there is a 10% false negative rate with the COVID-19 test. So a patient in the course of an epidemic, when almost everyone is having this illness, a person who has typical symptoms of high fever, shortness of breath, cough, um, 
or infiltrates of a chest X-ray uh, should be treated as COVID-19, even if their test is negative. Now, patient who comes in with typical symptoms, and if, if it's going to take time to get the COVID-19 uh, test done, they should immediately have a chest X-ray. Um, and if the chest X-ray shows infiltrates, uh, that could be a sign of COVID-19 or an alternatively, even a C high resolution CT scan can be quickly done. And also this can confirm COVID-19 in the presence of typical symptoms, even when the COVID-19 test has not come back yet. So various hospitals have, dis have, have developed various ways of triaging their patients with COVID-19. And depending on uh, how sick they are, they go either into the intensive care or other kinds of uh, areas. Now, there are two tests for COVID-19. There's the nasopharyngeal swab for PCR. It detects active infection. Uh, and a patient is uh, diagnosed based on this. The antibody testing is to test for immunity, but it's not at all a reliable test yet. There are no reliable tests available yet. Um, and also a very low percentage of people who recovered from the disease actually showing positive antibodies. So we're not sure of the clinical utility of this test just yet. So it's very important for us to recognize the ill patients and triage them appropriately. Lab tests, which can be got, show, may show high white blood cell count, but usually showing very high CRPs. A normal procalcitonin is present in patients with COVID-19. This normal procalcitonin, if it is, uh, is one of the pathognomic features, whereas a high procalcitonin would uh, reflect a bacterial infection or a secondary bacterial infection in addition to COVID-19. And in patients who have a high, COVID, uh, high procalcitonin, they should be treated with antibiotics in addition to their normal treatments for COVID-19. Patients uh, who are elderly, who have a low lymphocyte count, who have low oxygen saturations, or uh, multiple infiltrates of the CT scan should be triaged as high risk, and they should be um, you know, monitored frequently. If they are tachypneic or their, red, or their oxygen saturation is less than 93% or tachycardic, they need to go into an intensive care setting or where they can be monitored more closely. In the intensive care, they would, re they would receive high flow nasal cannula oxygen or uh, CPAP. They would receive fluids and pro probably prone position if their oxygen is Hello, I'm Dr. Humaira Bhatsha, and I'm going to speak a little bit about treatment, briefly about treatment, just to bring people a bit up to date about what the various treatments are for COVID-19. So we spoke a little bit about these uh, first few slides. We spoke a little bit in the previous uh, presentation I did, but I think it's important to repeat some of this. Respiratory pressures um, and, and some uh, controversy about P. This is from the Lancet. They, they recommend high flow nasal oxygen. If this doesn't work, uh, they intubate. Uh, tidal volumes are six ml per kg predicted body weight. You can reduce this to four ml per kg. Peak plateau airway pressure should be maintained less than 30 centimeters. The peak can be moderate to high levels if needed. There is some controversy about this, and some um, schools of thought are that uh, we should be using lower peak. I think the jury is out on this. Other ICU um, uh, measures such as um, neuromuscular blockade, um, prone position, inhaled nitrous oxide sometimes is used. Aim for a negative fluid balance of five to 10 liters, five, sorry, five, 0.5 to one liter, per day. Uh, sometimes um, dialysis would be needed. Antibiotics for secondary bacterial infections, especially if you see a procalcitonin level greater than a uh, high procalcitonin level, which is not usually seen with COVID-19, consider antibiotics strongly. Steroids are not recommended and ECMO are needed sometimes for the sicker patients. Anticoagulant treatment, um, there is, um, uh, there's been seen that COVID-19 induces a hypercoagulable state. The excess thrombin generation and fibrinolysis shutdown causes this, as well as hypoxia itself leads to a hypercoagulable state. The American Society of Hematology recommends anticoagulation for all patients. This is from a lecture by Professor Carlo Selmi, who was an Italian professor at the front lines in Lombardy, Italy. And they recommend um, um, enoxaparin uh, and based on D-dimer levels, uh, they would uh, anticoagulate patients based on their body weight. Now, the COVID-19 has several parts, a membrane protein, an envelope protein, a spike protein, and these can be uh, targets for various medications and vaccines which are in development. 
the main thing about COVID-19, I think, is we need to differentiate. There's a viral phase, which is like very much like flu, and a later stage, which induces a cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome, which we call CRS very acute manifestations of uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, multi-organ failure, and death. And there's a cascade of cytokines released here from TNF to interleukin-1 to IL-6. But the main ones we want to think about are interleukin-6, IL-6, IL-1, and, and, and TNFs, because we have targets uh, for these particular cytokines. So the treatment protocols, I will think of it as at early uh, stages, we use antivirals, um, and maybe anti-malarials, and in the later stages, in the cytokine storm, we use things like anti-interleukin-6, anti-IL-1, baricitinib, which is a JAK-1 inhibitor, and sometimes colchicine as well. So the antivirals which are being used um, are, are targeting proteolysis. So there is the lopinavir-ritonavir combination, which is Caletra, um, and um, we also have the remdesivir, which is uh, working on an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So remdesivir has been, is now in clinical trials, it's being used widely, um, and we still don't know well if these drugs are working or not. There has also been um, talk about developing monoclonal antibodies against the spike protein, just like is used in many rheumatology drugs where we, uh, where we target the receptors or the actual proteins, uh, preventing attachment of the virus to the receptor. Anti-malarials have been uh, the target of great um, hope, actually, um, and we think that they somehow work on the endosomal pH by increasing endosomal pH and interfere with glycosylation of the ACE receptor. As we know, the ACE receptor plays a role uh, in the virus attaching or it enters the, um, enters the alveolus through the ACE2 receptor. So um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine share the same mechanism of action, but hydroxychloroquine seems to work better and also have a better safety profile than chloroquine. They're both promising drugs for prevention and treatment, but the jury's still out as far as the, um, the clinical trials are there. There was a lot of hope from this French study, which was a very tiny study, but people were so excited um, that it's, it's sort of increased the combination of HCQ and azithromycin Increase the clearance of the virus from the nasopharynx after six days of therapy. Uh, 14 patients in the treated group uh, versus two out of 16 patients in the untreated group. And based on this very small, non-randomized study, people had a great hope. We would not normally accept this, but that shows um, how desperate we are in the situation. A Chinese trial showed um, a significant improvement of COVID-19 in 62 patients after five days of HCQ. There's civil, severe limitations of the study, and some other studies have failed to show any benefit of hydroxychloroquine. However, we need to be um, uh, hopeful because hydroxychloroquine is quite a safe drug to use. As a rheumatologist, we've used it for, for decades with no problems. We're not concerned really about uh, heart blocks and other symptoms of this. But in COVID-19 itself, patients can have myocarditis. Even some patients who do not have respiratory symptoms have myocarditis. We see high troponin levels. So maybe they are already at risk for cardiac problems. And so some care should be taken. I would suggest that patients who are being treated with hydroxychloroquine get a baseline ECG. There's also uh, uh, like some, some um, controversy about whether ACE inhibitors can be safely used. It's thought that the virus uh, enters the alveolus through the ACE2 receptors, and there was some concern that using ACE inhibitors, um, which are commonly used in patients with high blood pressure or diabetes, uh, could increase their, um, their uh, you know, predisposition to getting the COVID-19 or getting serious manifestations of this. However, all, all um, the professional bodies, such as the cardiology and uh, endocrinologists, I recommended that patients continue to stay on the ACE inhibitors. There are some um, places where the protocol is that if a patient is admitted with COVID-19, then ACE inhibitors are avoided in these patients till we have further information. Now about the cytokine storm, how do we treat it? How do we treat this acute respiratory distress syndrome? Obviously we like to use steroids, but for many reasons, including increasing risk of infection, we prefer to avoid steroids. These are um, what the CT scans of many patients look like with severe multiple um, uh, infiltrates bilaterally. 
So uh, in rheumatology, we have been using many of these drugs. Anti-IL-6, interleukin-6 cytokine, plays a central role in the cytokine storm induced toxicity uh, and the cytokine release syndrome. Many studies have come out of China where they've actually shown that patients had high levels of, um, of uh, IL-6. Uh, so also we've used um, this tocilizumab, tocilizumab or Actemra as it's called, in interstitial lung disease caused by autoimmune diseases. We've used it for rheumatoid arthritis. It's safe for ILD. Uh, in a retrospective study on 21 patients with severe ARDS due to SARS-CoV-2, they treated them successfully with a single rescue dose of tocilizumab, 400 milligrams intravenously. So many, many uh, anecdotal reports are coming from many parts of the world. I have friends in Singapore, in the UAE, who have treated their patients successfully with tocilizumab. Uh, the Italian and Chinese guidelines recommend that we use tocilizumab in COVID-19. Uh, some in China, they're actually checking the levels of interleukin-6 and IL-1. The Italians are not really recommending that we need to check this before, and they're just uh, deploying this drug in these situations, um, especially if the patient had high D-dimers, high CRP, high ferritin, or high fibrinogen levels, and they have worsening progression of the interstitial pneumonia, and we try to time it at the end of the high viral load phase. And when we feel like they're going into the cytokine storm with the worsening interstitial infiltrates and these levels of high CRPs, D-dimers, fibrinogen, and ferritin. The many trials are currently undergoing uh, before the anti-IL-6. Anti-interleukin-1 has been used a lot for macrophage activation syndrome. We have uh, used anakinra in this, but anakinra is a bit uh, difficult to come by. Uh, sometimes there's an availability issue as well as it's not being deployed currently and so nobody has really had much experience of using anti-IL-1 uh, because it's, it, it uh, sort of blocks the uh, NLRP3 inflammasome activation and, release and uh, prevents release of interleukin-1 beta. Um, colchicine has a similar me me method of action. Colchicine, the old gout drug, to a lesser extent, can also work on the inflammasome. Um, and prevent IL-1 release. So sometimes that can be used. We can, we can add colchicine to our repertoire. Baricitinib Jack, is a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor. What is a JAK inhibitor? JAK is Janus kinase, which is pre present on cell surfaces, and inhibiting JAK inhibits a lot of downstream cytokine release. So it um, is very useful in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We have used it in lupus and psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. It is a wide, wide uh, spread of uh, clinical efficacy in autoimmune diseases. There is a trial ongoing for use of baricitinib in COVID-19, but there are some concerns of its um, um, ability to worsen infection. So we have to be careful with these drugs, including the tocilizumab and the baricitinib, especially in patients who have a secondary bacterial infection. If a person has a high procalcitonin level, you would have to cover them with antibiotics. We may be in a situation where a patient is in a cytokine storm with coexisting bacterial infection. And in those situations, we really have to be very careful with antibiotic cover as well. Now, in a patient who has very severe bacterial infection and is very ill with COVID-19, IVIG is something which we could use. We've had a patient uh, treated in the UAE um, who had mostly gastrointestinal symptoms, but improved with intravenous immunoglobulin levels. GMCSF is also playing a central role um, and has been described uh, that it could be useful in COVID-19 patients because GMCSF has shown to be high. Also, clinical trials are, being, are undergoing in this particular thing. But ultimately, we are searching for the holy grail, the vaccine. Many of the drugs we talked about today don't have any clinical trials or proper data. Uh, most of the protocols initially to start with are using a combination of hydroxychloroquine and antiviral drugs such as Skeletra. And when a patient gets more ill, uh, they are adding uh, the tocilizumab or considering JAK inhibitors. For now, that's all we have unfortunately, in our COVID-19 repertoire. Thank you for listening. Uh, we will hopefully be back when we have more information.